So today we're going to talk about uh, the, the trade routes that have long existed and will be enhanced during the post-classical period. We're going to talk about some new trade routes. We're going to talk about some cities that develop that become important in those trade routes. We're going to talk about new technologies that enhance the trade. We're going to talk about some state practices, like things that these, these empires, these states are setting up to enhance trade. Um, despite this not being the first thing we're talking about within this post-classical period, we talked about all the empires first, laid down their development first, and now we're going back. The College Board chose trade to be its first key concept in this third period. So why do you think the College Board chose trade connections to be the first, the, the primary thing to talk about in this, this key concept? And if you look through all of the key concepts, many of them deal with trade connections between empires. Why do you think they chose this? Yes? Yeah, yeah. So, so empires largely come together because of this trade. You know, that yes, there are there is going to be conflict and there's going to be wars between empires, uh, but the wars stop. Sometimes the wars take breaks, but what never stops is the trade contacts. Everybody's always trying to make make a dollar. So I think these trade contacts. Um, in the historic reality, if, of course, by the way, the I, AP wants us to teach it, the trade contacts become really the most important contacts between civilizations of this period. All right? So we've got some trade. We talked about trade in our last period, and we talked about four primary trade networks, right? The Silk Road, that's, that's the, the biggest and the baddest of them all in, in the, the, the classical period. And then what else did we mention? Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean Network, and we see that here. Silk Road's up here. Indian Ocean Network here. And then we had two more. Yes, ma'am? Very good. Sub-Saharan Trade Network. I, I recall um, when we took our last test, I had a lot of people shooting that, that, that trans-Saharan network across here. The Sahara is more in, in certainly northern Africa, but certainly in northwestern Africa. So we're talking about contacts going across here. Um, and then we have one more that we're leaving off. Yes, sir? Something's happening in Europe. Something is happening in Europe, and it's the Mediterranean network, okay, connecting, connecting North Africa to Southern Europe. Wait, the name doesn't make sense because the Mediterranean Sea is not, like, in the north. The Mediterranean Sea is not in the north. That's, like, that's the only thing. Depends on your perspective. If you're living here, the Mediterranean Sea is in the north, right? Um, but anyhow, um, the Mediterranean Sea is, is going to be connecting Europe, North Africa, um, and, and obviously the Silk Roads. So let's talk about the Silk Road first because this was like the dominant trade network of the classical period. We are going to remember a lot of this is review. It, not, not too much changes with regard to where the Silk Road is, what it connects, the goods that are traveling on it. This is all very similar to what's going on in the classical period. Remember the AP likes this similar stuff. What do they call them? continuity. So there's going to certainly be some continuities on the Silk Road trade network. We are going to remember that despite what this looks like, the Silk Road is not one road. It's a network of routes um, connecting East Asia, connecting China in East Asia to the Western world. And again, this is something of perspective when we're talking about the Western world in the post-classical period or in the classical period. We're talking about this stuff, all right? Like, for example, the Middle East is the Western world. The Middle East doesn't become the Middle East until when? And at least until Europeans are drawn maps, right? Remember, the Middle East is like the middle between the European, maybe British map makers, and China, the Far East. So halfway between them and the Far East is the Middle East. So the Middle East as a, as a, as a term for a, like a geographic location doesn't make any sense. Um, at least, like, for example, if you are in India, the Middle East makes no sense whatsoever, right? Because that's to the west of you. It's all about who makes the maps and from what perspective we're making those maps. Anywho, the, the classical Silk Roads connected Far East and, and Asia to what the AP is maybe going to call Southwest Asia, or today we refer to primarily as the Middle East. Um, items traded um, on these networks, primarily silk. Okay, that, that should be no shock to anybody. But we're also going to see coming from the East, ceramics and porcelains. 
And then, like, some fine stones, like jade and some metalworking, uh, like, like bronze, coming from the east. And from the west, making its way to Asia, we'll see a lot of gold and precious metals. And in, in large respects, the gold is being traded for the silk, right? So, so China brings silk, and the rest of the world is bringing gold for that exchange. Why is China going to tremendously benefit from trading gold and like accepting gold and silver for their silk? Why is that such a good deal for the Chinese? Yes. Because gold holds value. Gold holds value, sure. Gold today is valuable. Gold a thousand years ago was valuable. Uh, what do you want to say, Mr. Surhai? So, very good. Silk can be a very much a renewable resource. For gold, you have to keep finding more. Um, so, so this is, is quite valuable for, for the Chinese traders. And then, when you, like, let me ask this question. What is heavier, Samira? What's heavier, a pound of gold or a pound of silk? You guys are too smart, all right? All right. But what is more valuable? What, what is more valuable? Um, you know, the, the commensurate weight in silk or the commensurate weight in gold. I guess I don't even know that answer. But gold is much more easy to transport. Or pardon me, silk is much more easy to transport. It's far lighter uh, than, than the gold that they're trading for. Yes? Um, also, the, we were a monopoly. There's no other, there's no other region in the world where they to make silk. In the classical period. That's going to change in the post-classical era. Uh, but no one will do it quite as well as the Chinese, even through the post-classical period. But the monopoly will come to an end. Uh, in, the, in this post-classical period. So we've got silk, we've got ceramics, we've got jade, and then um, on the flip side going from, from west to east, gold and other precious metals like silver and ivory. We know what ivory is, right? Poor elephants. What, is ivory from there too? No, ivory from the western world, from Africa, uh, making its way to, to Asia. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. These trade networks are connecting each other. So, yes, yeah, stuff from, sub from sub-Saharan Africa might make it to the northern, uh, northern Africa and get on Mediterranean routes, make it to the eastern Mediterranean and get on Silk Road and make it all the way into China. Absolutely. 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 Yes, sir? Um, I also don't understand why ivory was so valuable. Why is gold valuable? It's, it's, it's hard to get, but, like, ivory is... I recycle your resources, all you have to do is Yeah, but, you know, elephants are hard to grow. We were talking about horse farms earlier. Elephants take even longer to grow. Um, it's, you can make stuff out of it. Um, you've, you ever hear of scrimshaw? Like, that, that's like, it could be whalebone or ivory. Um, yeah, yeah, handles and, and, you know, fine art. Like, it's, eh, it's valuable. That's why we have no elephants hardly today, right? Because ivory must be valuable. It, things are only valuable when people want them, right? Um, so ivory kind of combines something that people want and something that's hard to get, and so it's valuable. Um, all right, so we've, got, um, we, we've talked about the Silk Road being around for a long time. Let's, let's remind ourselves of this historic evolution of the Silk Road. It's going to have its birth during the earliest Chinese dynasties, like the Han Dynasty. And as China becomes centralized and as they can better police the trade routes, trade will flourish on the Silk Road. There will be further connections with the Western world as, you know, very early on we get Alexander the Great and his conquests uniting much of, of the Greek world with the Persian world, for example, and then that hopping onto the, the Silk Roads. But then, of course, the rise of the Roman Empire the rise of the Roman Empire and the consolidation of that empire will link up the western portions of the Silk Road with the eastern portions of the Silk Road. The growth of Islam in the 7th century, the growth and expansion of Islam, and here on this map we can see all of this, this checked territory, our hash-marked territory, that's the Islamic world. With the growth and the consolidation of an Islamic world, we're going to have a further expansion of trade on the Silk Road network. And then if we fast forward many other centuries into the, the 13th and 14th century, we're going to enter a period known as Pax Mongolica, 
or the Mongolian peace, where the Mongols will conquer everything, basically the entirety of the Silk Road from, uh, from China all the way to uh, the, the Black Sea. We are going to have a Mongol Empire, and they will make trade and travel on the Silk Road far safer, and they will encourage that trade to, to continue. Uh, so that, that we can see as maybe a high point of Silk Road trade. All right? We press on. We've got another trade route to talk about, Mediterranean Sea. And here we see that in the green. Mediterranean Sea Network also linking up with the Black Sea. You guys should know this body of water to the north of Turkey. It's called the Black Sea. Uh, so the Mediterranean Sea um, connected with the Black Sea. Again, at its height during the height of the Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire controlled the Mediterranean Sea, when they called it Mare Nostrum or Our Sea, when, they called it, when that was all theirs, obviously trade on that trade network will flourish because there's going to be very little conflict. But then Rome falls, and we're going to, of course, have a decline in trade in the Mediterranean Sea. Yes? The Black Sea is just to the north of the Mediterranean Sea, right here. So this is Turkey. This is what's called the Anatolian Peninsula. Just to the north of that is the Black Sea. So you said so, um, the Mediterranean Sea, like they say, you flourish during the Pax Romana, like something like that? Yeah, flourish during the height of the Roman Empire. Rome falls. Mediterranean Sea trade falls. Because now we've got some competition for that trade. For example, with the birth of Islam in the 7th century, now you have in the eastern Mediterranean competition between Arab merchants and Byzantine merchants, that, that eastern Roman Empire. Yeah? How does that make trade? How does that make trade? Well, when they're, it, it could increase competition, but that could also be followed by like military ships entering, entering the fray. There's going to be a lot of naval battles between Mediterranean fleets of, of the Arabs and the, the Byzantine. Yes? Um, instead of who conflicted over, over the Mediterranean Sea, you said the Arabs? The Arabs and the Byzantine Empire. Byzantines? Okay. Yep, we should know this. But the Islamic Empire, which will eventually become dominant in much of the Mediterranean, the Islamic Empire, is actually going to be a very pro-trade empire. Going back to Muhammad himself, what was Muhammad's job before he became the prophet? Merchant. He was a merchant. That's how he got to see so much of, of the, the world compared to the average Bedouin um, uh, or Arabian in, in the 7th century. So Muhammad himself was a merchant. So, so Islam, and kind of written within the religion of Islam, merchants and traders have a, have a high regard. So we're going to see an expansion of trade with the expansion of Islam. Does it expand the Mediterranean Sea trade? Absolutely. Because Me eventually, what does Islam do? It conquers most of the Middle East, and it conquers all of North Africa. So they've got like two-thirds of, of the Mediterranean Sea covered there. Yes, ma'am? If uh, the Silk Road was so important to China, why were merchants considered to be... That's a good question. Confucianism. Yeah, I think, we, do, I think we just go to Confucianism. Huh? I, think, I think Confucianism ideal think that the merchants make everything more pricey. Mm -hmm. That's not good for everybody, so they don't like it. Yeah, and, and remember also, um, in China... China's bringing in a lot of, like, gold and silver with their trade. They're not bringing in a lot of, um, they're not bringing in a lot of better stuff from overseas. They're not bringing in a lot of luxury goods coming from outside. Um, they're sending luxury goods out, and they're bringing in gold and silver for that, uh, which is certainly going to benefit the wealthy, but... Um, the, the average people maybe don't see a, a lot from that, a lot of benefit from that. But yeah, it, I, I think we just have to go all the way back to Confucianism and, and merchants are middlemen who often raise the price of the goods that, higher than they would otherwise be. Yes, ma'am? I have a question about this Islamic Empire. When you were talking about their trade expanding as they're expanding, yeah. are you meaning that like, when they start expanding towards like, Western North Africa, yeah. As they expand, trade will follow them. As the Islamic Caliphate expands, trade follows them. I, I think that's the, the best way to say it. Um, we will see later in this time period the growth of important cities within Italy, in the northern Mediterranean, like Venice. Venice is the one we want to think of most when we're thinking of Mediterranean trade routes. The city-state of Venice. There is no Italy. There will not be a united Italy until the 1800s. So the city-state of Venice becomes... Uh, supremely important in controlling uh, Mediterranean trade. 
And in fact, by the time, by the era of the Crusades, we're going to see a rivalry pop up between Venice, who wants to control Mediterranean trade, and Constantinople, who has long been controlling aspects of Mediterranean trade, especially connecting the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. And that fourth crusade that we briefly mentioned in here, rather than the crusaders making their way to the Holy Lands to try to solidify those for Christian um, control, the fourth crusade actually targeted Constantinople itself. So you have Western European crusaders who are sacking Constantinople in the fourth crusade. And it's all about controlling trade routes. These guys, they, they were kind of invited in um, at the time, yeah. Um, remember, they were, they were all Christians. They, they, they did not go with the expressed purpose of, of crushing the city, but they did ultimately that. We have a Trans-Saharan network. We've already mentioned that briefly. We've got a Trans-Saharan network that was there in the classical period. There. But again, the growth and the expansion of the Islamic caliphates will expand Trans-Saharan trade network as Islam will make its way across the Saharan Desert into what we call the sub-Saharan states like Ghana and Mali, we will see an expansion of trade between those Islamic states south of the Sahara and now the Islamic kingdoms in the north. Primarily um, traded on the Trans-Saharan network, just like in the classical period. We've got a lot of gold. Silver, or pardon me, gold, salt, ivory, and unfortunately, but we'll talk much more about this in, in a later date, uh, slaves coming from sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, they're, they're, uh, they're between the, the, the cities north of Sahara and cities south of it? Yep. So here we have um, Trans-Saharan Trade Networks. The city of Timbuktu, you guys have probably heard that before. I think it made its way in the book Hop on Pop. You might remember that from your childhood. Okay. Uh, so Timbuktu, uh, an important city in, uh, in present-day Mali and of the, of the classical or post-classical Malian state. But the big daddy of Mali, yes, sir? Is, is Timbuktu like... Um the, you were saying the Mali Empire, yeah. is that from like the, the King Mansa Musa who like um, went on a... Mm -hmm. Yep, that's him. Mm -hmm. the, grand, the Hajj. The Hajj, yeah. yes. But the big daddy of them all during the post-classical period is not the Silk Road, and it's not the Trans-Saharan Network, and it's not the Mediterranean Sea Network. The big daddy of trade networks during the post-classical period is going to be the Indian Ocean Trade Network. In terms of the amount of people involved in the trade, or the amount of goods that are being traded, or the amount of wealth that is being exchanged, the Indian Ocean Trade Network outpaces them all in the post-classical period. You can put far more stuff onto ships, heavy stuff onto ships, and take it long distances far more easily, quickly, cheaply, than you can on the backs of camels or on wagons, all right? So this is not that they were better traders or anything like that, all right? It's just far cheaper during this time period. Remember, this is before we have railroads, right? It's far cheaper to transport heavy items, bulky items, over long distances via sea routes than it is via land routes. That's what, so that with increased uh, navigational technology on the open seas, better ships, for example, will make the Indian Ocean Trade Network the dominant trade route of this period. We still have a continuity from earlier times, though. Those monsoon winds that we talked about that facilitated trade during the classical period, those will still be crucially important. So we will have largely seasonal trade uh, in the Indian Ocean Network, especially going from Africa into India. And as I said, trade in those very expensive bulk items that were more difficult to move over land uh, would become uh, very important on the Indian Ocean Network. So things like timber, lumber. 
You don't have a lot of trees in, in East Africa here. All right? So we can import them from other places. Ivory, again. Cotton. Like Egyptian cotton will make its way. Egypt has long been a, a hotbed for cotton production. Make its way down the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean network to the rest of the world. Indian cotton making it um, on the network. And then, of course, spices. Yes, uh, anybody? Question, comment? Um, I forgot the first material you mentioned. Uh, timber, lumber. Okay. But wait, I, I, thought, like, I thought there were no trees in Africa. Well, there might not be trees in Africa, but there's certainly trees in India. Right? So, so there are trees to be had. That's why they're trading. This network will not be dominated by any one empire. So you've got a lot of different people entering into the Indian Ocean network, but they're not warring with each other. They're not, there's not really much conflict on this Indian Ocean network. There's room for everybody. That will change once the Europeans get involved in it in the next period, but for now, this is a pretty cosmopolitan area. When I use that word cosmopolitan, we mean people from all different kinds of places uh, coexisting and taking part in this trade. So it's not dominated by any one empire. But, again, the expansion of the Islamic world from the Middle East through Arabia into East Africa and eventually into northern India, eventually into Indonesia, will facilitate a lot of that trade. But there's no, in, there's no Islamic empire that dominates the trade networks. All right? We're also going to see a growth of what are known as the Swahili city-states. The Swahili city-states are those East African cities that will develop as hubs for trade on the Indian Ocean network. So stuff will make its way from Central Africa to the coast to cities like you've heard of today, like Mogadishu. You guys have heard of that. It's the capital of Somalia today. Mogadishu was a, it was a, is a post-classical city. It's one of these Swahili city-states. Swahili, guys, is just a language of the people of East Africa. Uh, it's kind of a blending of traditional African languages with Arabic. So a number of cities on the eastern coast of Africa uh, are going to develop and enter into this trade network, facilitating that trade. Everybody good? Questions, comments, concerns? All right. We need to know, are we noticing that this is pretty map heavy? Yeah, yeah I guess what we're going to start our day with next class. You guys are going to get to, I'm not going to make you color because I have a thing against making it. You can color. I'm not going to prohibit you from coloring. You want to color? Yeah, then you can color. All right? Uh, but if you don't want to color, you don't have to color. But you are going to have to know where a lot of places are. All right. The College Board wants you guys to know where a few important trading cities are that will develop and grow and help facilitate this trade during the post-classical era. I want you guys to not only know these cities, but to start to recognize the names of these cities and like what they kind of look like. So whether you know a city or not, you can kind of guess that, yeah, I've seen a city like that, and that kind of looks like a Russian word, like Novgorod. Okay? Kind of a Russian looking word. Or Timbuktu. Kind of an African looking word. Or Hangzhou. Kind of a Chinese looking word. These are obviously only a handful of the cities that, that, that exist during this time period or that are important to trade. So I want you, when you see others on questions that we may not have studied, to at least try to connect it to a region because you can recognize what that city looks like. So let's talk about a few of these. Novgorod in the north. Um, obviously, it's a part of this Kievan Rus world. All right, it's a Russian city. They are a member of a, an important trading organization called the Hanseatic League. We're going to talk about that in a few more minutes. Hanseatic League, H-A-N-S-E-A-T-I-C, Hanseatic League. And they will connect with northern European merchants. So these guys can connect with this chunk of the world. What is this chunk of the world up here? What do we call this chunk of the world? Scandinavia. Scandinavia. They will connect Scandinavian merchants and other northern European merchants to what's going on to the south of them. Well, okay, that's the Black Sea. So what empires are around here? The Byzantine Empire. They will connect northern European merchants to the Byzantine Empire. 
And then what's slightly south of them? That they to the Arab world. All right, so Novgorod will develop as a, as a hub between Northern Europe and the Byzantine Arab world. We already mentioned Swahili city-state, so I'm not going to talk about that again. Yes? I think it's kind of, it's really convenient in Novgorod because I think um, close to that or near to that is um, the river uh, Dnieper. The Dnieper River, yeah. Which leads down directly to absolutely. the Black Sea, so it's really easy to connect from the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And absolutely, sea. absolutely. Let's take a look at um, the city of Baghdad. Baghdad, brand new city, right? Capital of what caliphate? The Islam, they're all Islamic caliphates. Capital of? Umayyad. The Umayyad Caliphate. Very good. So Islam is born in Arabia, but when the Umayyads begin to expand, they develop a new capital in the city of Baghdad. And Baghdad, notice, is on what trade route? Very good. So I think this becomes a chicken or an egg kind of thing, guys. Um, what comes first, the, the trade or the city that facilitates trade? I, I think the city is built there because it's already on an important connection with the Silk Road. There's already wealth flowing through this era, area. And also, the city of Baghdad is right on two very important rivers, right? What rivers? Euphrates. Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Very good. So the, the city of Baghdad will become an important hub on the western Silk Road. Please, please, please do not only think China when you think Silk Road. All right? It's connecting China. Like, most of the Silk Road is, in fact, not China. Right? So, Baghdad. Uh, next one is Malacca. And actually, I'm going to leave this map up here. Malacca. M-A-L-A-C-C-A -A -A or M-E-L-A-K-A. -A. Guys, the, the Latin language, the Latin script that we use is not used by everybody around the world. Right? So when we see two words that look like they would sound the same if we were to pronounce them phonetically, but they're spelled differently, we are going to assume they're the same city. So you might see two different spellings of Malacca. It's no big deal. We can all handle that. Malacca is right down here. This is in what present-day country? Singapore. No, Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Indonesia. And th this is the Malay Peninsula. This is Malaysia, and this gets into Indonesia. And so the Malacca, the city of Malacca is on a strait, a narrow waterway called the Straits of Malacca. So if you are the Indian Ocean Trade Network, and you, we often think about that, we talked about that in the post-classical period, primarily heading this way down to Africa. But the Indian Ocean Network also heads east. So if you have goods coming from India and they want to make their way to China, rather than going all the way around, they go through the Straits of Malacca. So if you are the city of Malacca, you control all the trade going through Malacca. And what do you get to do when you control that important trade route? Yeah, you can, you can put tolls on anything that goes through. Just like when you guys want to go to Canada, what do you have to do to drive to Canada? Yeah, well, you have to have a passport. So the federal government's getting a little bit of money because you go to, go to Canada. And then you have to do what as you get on the bridge? You have to pay the trolls, right? They don't want to let you across. It is, it's a trading hub between India and China. It's a, it's a, um, a conduit between trading between India and China, or the Indian Ocean Network and China. So anything that's making its way from East Asia on the Indian Ocean Network to India or to Africa is likely going through the Straits of Malacca, so the people that control the city of Malacca, originally Indonesians, are going to become very wealthy. All right? Yes, ma'am. So are the people that control this, like, kind of tribe? Or is it like a it, it, let's think of it as a, a city-state right now. Eventually, it's going to fall into the realm of, of an Indonesian state that will eventually be conquered by the Portuguese. Uh, but that's going to be much later. All right, yeah, the Portuguese are going to get involved. Um, we want to remember, too, there is some trade going on in the Americas, but the trade in the Americas is much different. All right? Trade in the Americas is much different. They're going to have far less sophisticated maritime trade. They're not doing nearly as much sea trade 
as we're going to see in the old world. And while there is land-based trade, there's far less of that. Because what do these people of the Americas lack that they have in the rest of the world? The wheel. They don't have the wheel. And what else don't they have? They don't have those draft animals. They don't have those beasts of burden, the horses. They don't have oxen, none of that stuff. So when you are picturing like idyllic paintings of Native Americans hunting buffalo on horseback, that is much later. That's not until after the Spanish bring them, all right? So there's no horse. What are the beasts of burden of the Americas? Think of Diego. Alpaca, and, and my next map. Alpacas and llamas, that's it. They've got nothing in Mesoamerica. Alpacas, llamas, and guinea pigs. And they put such adorable little carts on those guinea pigs. But they're not really good at carrying heavy items, okay, for, for long distance travel. So here is where we sit back. Everybody sit back. And let's marvel for a second at the network that the Incans, for example, can create in, in South America along the Andes Mountains at what they can create and the network of roads that they're able to construct and the tremendous cities that they're able to build all without the wheels all without horses all without oxen all right llamas are cool but they're not able to do the same kind of work that the big animals are able to do in in the the old world all right but there is trade still all right it's not like they're not trading in Mesoamerica, for example, the Aztecs are trading gems, exotic feathers for headdresses and such. And cocoa, the cacao beans that, that make chocolate, right? Cocoa. And down in the Incan Empire, obviously the, the Incan Empire is going to facilitate the construction of these roads that we've talked about that will link up their empire for trade. But far less important, far less uh, sophisticated than what we're seeing in the old world. It's not because they couldn't do it necessarily, it's just they lacked the same equipment that, that they have in the old world. Everybody good? Yes, ma'am. There would be, yeah, there would be trade amongst, amongst Native American groups in, in North America, sure. Uh, more, more limited, um, you know, not, not as many of the, like, the luxury goods or the, the, the manufactured products that we're going to see in, in the Western or in the Eastern world, the Old World. Hannah. Why do I refer, why do you think I refer to the Eastern world as the Old World? Yeah, it... So there were people, certainly, there, like if we're going way back, there were people in Africa first, and then they spread out from there, and much later they're going to be making it to the Americas. Uh, but when we talked about the River Valley civilizations, you guys remember this from last year? You guys talked about this? River Valley civilizations, give them to me. Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia in the Middle East. I, I can't hear everybody. Let me, let me go over here. I want to hear someone from this table. The Indus River Valley in India. Uh, back in the back, Kaylee. Kay the Nile River Valley in Egypt. Are we missing anything? Yes. The Wanghe in China, the Yellow River in China. Those all, though the earliest development of those city-states, we date those back to like five, six, seven thousand years ago. All right. So we're going, we're going pretty far back for the development of those civilizations, and far earlier than the development of what we would call modern civilizations in, in Mesoamerica. We call it the old world and the new world, though, because of our, like, biased American Eurocentric view of, of history. The old world is where, like, we all came from. The new world is where Christopher Columbus made it to when he sailed the ocean blue, right? So, so that's where that old and new world uh, come from. I don't want to call it the Western world yet because I already said the Western world. We're talking about Western Europe and the Middle East primarily. Good. Any other questions right now? Sweet, sweet. All right. Of primary importance during these trade routes, especially in that old world, is the trade of luxury goods. You are far better off, if you are a merchant, you are a far better off trading in silks and in gems and in spices. That is a far more profitable operation. 
Why? You can carry less for more of a profit. Very good. You are, you are going to make so much more money if you can, can carry, like when we're talking about like a value to weight ratio, that is far greater, like a high value to a low weight. Because you can pack up more onto your caravans, you can pack more onto your ships, which gives you far more to, to sell in return. So we're going to have the trade of luxury goods becoming of primary importance during this time period. So in a lot of respects, it's just the wealthy, it's the upper crust that are, that are truly benefiting from much of this trade. And what are those luxury goods? Of course, silks, porcelain from China, spices, and then gold and silver, trinkets and jewelry and things like this. All right, you guys should be able to walk away right now and write a decent little essay that the AP might be asking you about post-classical trade and the types of goods that are exchanged and the networks that they're traded on. Would we all feel comfortable doing that right now? Yeah. Sweet. Let's not do that right now because that's not fun. But we need to now talk uh, what I think is a little bit more fun, how we got stuff from point A to point B, and some of the new technologies that will develop during this time period. All right. That, what do we call this? What's going on there? Caravan. Very good. That is a camel caravan. Awesome, right? And those camels are all loaded up to carry things across the desert. Why do we love our camels so much? Very good. And we need a little basic camel biology. There's two kinds of camels. This kind of camel... That's a one hump camel. Do you know what it's called? Anybody know the scientific fancy name for it? Camel. Whoa, 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 whoa. Say it out loud and proud. Dromedary. The dromedary camel. camel. Very good. The dromedary camel. These guys live in the deserts of, of northern Africa. These are the Arabian camels. All right? These are those camels that do better in the really, 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 really hot stuff. All right? Two hump camels. Two hump camels. What are those guys? Anybody know their fancy name? No, you're cheating. Bactrian. Bactrian camels. All right. Let me find a better map here. I want to go all the way to this one. Uh, Bactrian camels are like from this part of the world. All right. The, the deserts of... of the Central Asian steppe, all right? Like the Gobi Desert, it gets very cold. These are the hairier camels, all right? Still no water. Remember, you, I, I think we, are, we sometimes confuse ourselves a little bit about deserts, because when we think about deserts, we think about hot, sandy places, right? What's the biggest desert in the world? Antarctica, right? So a desert doesn't need to be hot and sandy. A desert just means there's no, there's no precipitation. All right, so Bactrian camels in Central Asia or dromedary camels in, in Africa are still dealing with a lack of water, all right? So these are perfect for long distance trade over whether it's the Silk Road trade network or the Trans-Saharan trade network. They're perfect for long distance trade because they don't need to be watered very much, all right? They can make it for about 100 miles before refueling. That's pretty impressive, all right? The, hum the camels, oh, we're so greedy. The camels carry our water for us. Yeah. But you only have to give the camels water every 100 miles or so. The question is, how do they carry all that water? Because, because they're they camels. Look at that. They're, the camels carry it. They, 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 work they can carry much, though. Look at they, they can do all right. Yes, ma'am. How do they know this? Well, they wouldn't have called it a mile, because a mile is stupid, right? Yeah, a mile makes no sense. Um, but they would have their own, own units. But remember, if they, were, if they were in China, for example, uh, give me somebody that, that unified weights and measures in China to make... Yeah. So in, in China, we're going to have a unified system of weights and measures dating back to the classical era. And other civilizations will there have their own unified. Now... Today, we've tried to make it really easy in the world by develop the development of the metric system, although we don't play that game, because we like our 5,280 feet equals a mile. <laughs> Makes no sense, right? 
But anyway, yeah, now we can, we can look at a map. We can look at a camel today and say, oh, yeah, it makes it about 100 miles or whatever, a couple hundred kilometers or whatever measures of distance that they would have used. Everybody good? So caravan travel, caravan camel travel um, is going to be of supreme importance. We're going to have a couple developments that are going to facilitate this during the post-classical era. First, the camel saddle. The problem is you can't just set stuff on the humps. It doesn't stay on there very well, and they're kind of squishy. All right? So you have to build an adequate saddle that will allow you to put goods onto the camels. And with the development in the post-classical era of a camel saddle, you're going to be able to pack upwards of 500 to 1,000 pounds onto each camel. Crazy, huh? I know. We will also see sprouting up in Central Asia what are known as caravan serai. Caravan, caravan, and then connect to that S E R. S-E-R-E-I, Caravan Serai. I apologize if my pronunciation is off there, but I never saw that word before AP World History. So what is it? Caravan Serai. Caravan Serai, S-E-R-E-I. -E it's in your standards. I'm going to tell you. These are like roadside stops. These are pit stops. These are, these are road, uh, uh, what do we call them when we're driving? These are, they, they offer services, but it's like a rest station. It's a way station on the caravan, uh, cam uh, camel caravan routes where travelers can rest after a day's travel. And with the development and the growth of these sprouting up throughout uh, the uh, trade routes, and we can see each one, of the, this is the Anatolian Peninsula, so this is the Mediterranean Sea, this is today's Turkey, this is the Mediterranean Sea, this is the, Me uh, the Black Sea, and we see each one of these little dots represents another little caravan stop. So these would pop up, they would provide services, and guys, it's just like today. Business people, entrepreneurs, look and they might see an opportunity. Hey, we got all these camel travelers coming through. Maybe we'll build a little facility here and, uh, and help them get their, their water for their camels and get them a little rest and give them some food. And then we can make money off of them. And then we can make money off of them. Yes, sir? Uh, are they still there today? Um, you know, I, I, there's like ruins of them. They, they, they don't have an important role as for caravan travel, because obviously nothing travels by camel anymore. So, All right. Wait a second, I'm confused. Okay, <laughs> kill him here. So, I was, I was confused about the two types of camel you mentioned, okay? So you don't, I, you'll never be asked about the two types of camel. I just thought that might be, okay. <laughs> Dromedary camels have one hump. They live in like the deserts of Arabia and North Africa. Bactrian camels are hairier. They've got two humps. They live in Central Asia, all right, where it's, it's going to be a little colder. Like, uh, Arabic people and then North African people in, like, movies, they always have two humps. Really? Camels, so. I camels Yo. I don't know about that. All right. Everybody good? We also have some important new shipping technologies that will aid Indian Ocean travel, for example. This is an astrolabe. We're going to watch a very interesting TED Talk after lunch about the astrolabe. So this is the astrolabe. The astrolabe can use the stars, astro, like star, L-A-B-E, astrolabe. L-A-B-E, astrolabe. Astrolabe. This is a navigation device used uh, uh, on the Indian Ocean. And it's going to allow um, travelers to be able to travel at nighttime without seeing the coast. That's big. A magnetic compass will also be developed during this time. We have the Chinese to thank for this. Again, allowing travelers to travel away from the coastline. You know, in earlier travel, you have to hug the, the coast so you know where you are. And there's scary monsters that live far out in the open seas, right? Or you might fall off. Uh, most people knew you weren't going to fall off the earth. That, that's a little bit of a misnomer. But the Chinese develop a magnetic compass that's going to allow for further uh, open sea travel. We're going to have some new shipping technologies. Here's one that screwed my daughter up on her little history. My daughter's learning the same stuff right now as you guys. This is a caravel. Uh, this is a European trading ship. It is a, a, what we call a deep 
hull ship. Deep hull meaning the bottom of this ship goes very deep into the water, which makes it a lot more stable and you can pack more stuff onto it. It's a deep hull ship rather than a shallow hulled ship. This is like the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria of Christopher Columbus. So we talk about the Spanish caravels. My daughter, unfortunately, on her test mixed up caravel and caravan because they're practically the same word. And her fifth grade teacher is pretty harsh and doesn't allow retesting. So, But anyway, I'm hoping one day she can come to your school and be able to retest and not have to worry about so it now that she knows the difference. They so they can, they can travel more they're, they're send more stuff over longer distances. But when you want to talk about the ship-making empire that was really above all else, especially by the late uh, 14, by the 1400s, at the end of this post-classical period, we've it's got to look at China. Oh, it's not. Oh, never mind. These are the junks of China. Don't think of it as a, a junk as junky at all. It's, it's, it's one of the finer ships. And in fact, when we can extend this Chinese junk to what are known as the treasure ships of the Ming Dynasty, and we'll talk more about these at a later date, the treasure ships of the Ming Dynasty, they dwarf what anybody else in the world is doing. Here we have a drawing of a Ming Dynasty treasure ship that might have been commanded by a guy named Zheng He. Zheng He. He was a very interesting guy. We'll talk about him a little bit more later. He was a Chinese Muslim, like six foot six eunuch guy that was also a commander of the greatest Chinese fleet in human history uh, that made it from China and explored all of the Indian Ocean Basin. This is Zheng He's treasure ship. This is Christopher Columbus's ship. Grande. Pequeño. Grande. Pequeño. All right. Everybody good? A couple other developments that are outside of the technological realm that are going to facilitate trade. Banks. Western European banking houses. What does Western Europe lack that China has? What does Western Europe lack that the Islamic caliphates have? Anybody? Your unity. Unity. A central state, right? that can facilitate this travel and this trade. They don't have that. They don't have that strong centralized state organization that can unite large areas for trade. So Western Europe in this time period is going to develop a few financial tools, financial technologies that will allow them to begin to thrive, make a lot of money, but I think will allow Western Europe to become eventually the dominant power in the globe because they're not tied to a central state. First is the idea of banking houses, Western European banking houses. It's what we would today call a bank, right? And what do banks do for us? They hold our money. That's, that's, that's one. Like, if you want to keep your money safe, you put it in a bank and it can be safe. But then what do they do? Yes. Okay, they, they give out loans to people. They make investments. They give people some money so they can do something with it and hope to grow it bigger. All right? But banks also hold our money today. Like your parents might still do this. They might not do it with paper anymore. They might do it with a, with a debit card. They hold our money and give us a far more convenient way to do business. Right? So if you, if you have a debit card or a credit card even or a check from a bank, that means, you, especially the check or the debit card side, you have put money into that bank, and that bank vouches for you, and they give you a debit card or they give you checks. And now, instead of carrying around heaps of cash, you can just write one little paper check and give that, and, and the store will accept it, and the store can deposit that, and then that bank will wire that store its money. Do you see how much safer this is than wandering around with huge heaps of cash? And during time period when there weren't huge heaps of cash, when people were doing a lot of business, especially in Europe, in gold and silver coins, those are bulky, those are heavy, those are not easy to transport. 
Those are easy to notice people walking around jingling their way down the streets so bandits can steal their stuff. You don't want to do that. So banking houses will develop to provide a more convenient and a safer way to trade when you're traveling long distances. All right? They will issue bills of credit. All right? It's the first word, time this word is going to pop up in our, in our story here. They're going to issue bills of credit. All right? And then, you know, I, I guarantee you, I have this bill of credit that says I have money in this bank. And I am going to give you this bill of credit. And now you can get my money out of that bank's branch in your town. So banking houses will grow in Europe during the late post-classical period, which is going to facilitate trade in places where we don't have a central state organization. We will also have the development of insurance houses, insurance agencies, like a modern insurance agency. I drive a car every single day, and it's one of the craziest things ever, right? I bought a car for about $20,000. And I drive that on a road at high miles per hour through sometimes inclement weather amidst a lot of other crazy drivers, including you and your friends. Why do I feel safe taking my $20,000 investment and putting it on such a dangerous road? Because I have insurance. If something happens to that car, my insurance company will take I pay a little bit of money. I am basically betting on an insurance company. I am making a gamble that I will get into a wreck and destroy my car. The insurance company is making a gamble that I will continue to drive safely and they will never have to buy it. Unfortunately for the insurance companies, I have won that bet twice. All right? So I have made a lot. Insurance companies make money off of most people. I have made money off of insurance companies. Mwah. I've also gotten into a couple bad accidents and that's not good. But anyhow. We don't do crazy, stupid things without insurance. Buying a house is nuts. Spending $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 on a home is nuts when a strike of lightning can, can burn that house to the ground. That's insane. But we insure our house. And so if my house burns to the ground, that would be horrible. I didn't just give you an idea, did I? It's a sinister laugh. If my house burns to the ground, as devastating as that would be, it will get rebuilt for me by my insurance company. Awesome. So we wouldn't do crazy expensive things. Well, during this time period, what is a crazy expensive thing? Putting a heap of luxury goods onto a ship, onto the open sea. That's nuts. You wouldn't do it unless insurance companies would arise. And you could pay that insurance company. You could make a bet with that insurance company that you will actually sink your ship. And they're going to bet you that you won't. All right? And this can facilitate trade in places where there's not central governments facilitating it. Yes? I don't get why and how insurance would, like, what, what if, like, after two years, uh, you don't like your car anymore, and then you just, like, ram it into a tree and say, hey, insurance. Insurance fraud. Well, yeah, there is something called insurance fraud. You're not allowed to, to, you're not allowed to just burn down your own house. You're not allowed to purposely crash your own car. How do they know? know? Well, they might not. But they're not stupid either. Um, also, if you, like, wreck your car, get, like, when I crashed my car, it was an accident, I didn't do it on purpose. When I crashed my car, now my insurance is far more expensive. And if you do it again, you might find yourself borderline uninsurable. Like, you might not be able to afford insurance. And, one, one, and you can't legally drive in our state without having insurance. So if you become uninsurable you don't get to drive anymore. So, that's what it could come to. Uh, yeah? Uh, so, like, you said that, like, uh, the main reason why they emerged was to ensure traders mostly. Because they, yeah. Because they, they do all, all sorts of stuff that like, not simple stuff on ships, and they, they, the ship sinks, and they have no money. Yeah. It, but, but most ships aren't going to sink, and that's how they can stay in business. Because most people that pay insurance... Well, like, never collect. I, I've had homeowner's insurance for my entire life owning a home for, like, the last 15 years. My home has never burned down. I've never had to make a claim. Like, mo most people have insurance and never have to use it, right? Anyway, we, we press on. Um, in fact, we're going to go to lunch. We, we closed before lunch uh, talking about the developments in Western Europe in the absence of a strong state organization that would help facilitate trade, like banking houses and insurance houses and insurance agencies. Um, 
Now we're just going to spend a couple minutes talking about some things that states did themselves to facilitate trade. In Asia, in, in China, for example, uh, they developed what's known as paper money or flying money. Much like we talked about with the banking houses and the bills of credit, uh, having a paper currency that is far lighter and far easier to transport than gold or silver um, can allow for payments to be made uh, over long distances um, and not have to transport the bulk of gold or silver. <coughs> China also would, would construct massive engineering projects like the Grand Canal, and you can see the Grand Canal connecting northern and southern China here, uh, connect massive engineering product, projects like the Grand Canal, which is going to create internal trade connections between northern China and southern China, but also facil facilitate the trade of those goods further west on the, uh, the Silk Road. And finally, we want to remember about the Mongols. When the Mongols unite all of the lands that encompass the Silk Road from China all the way to the Black Sea, they will usher in an era known as Pax Mongolica that, that makes trade far easier and far safer on that trade route. So they will enhance the Silk Road trading network. They will enhance the way stations, uh, the stopping points on that Silk Road. They will make it far safer as they will begin to eliminate piracy and banditry on the Silk Road trade network so traders can uh, more easily travel back and forth. All right? In Western Europe, again, as we mentioned, there is no centralized organization, so we're going to have the development of not a state trade organization, but... A, a trade organization that goes beyond state boundaries. And this is known as the Hanseatic League. H-A-N-S-E-A-T-I-C. The Hanseatic League, or Hanseatic League. It's a, it's a trade network, it's a trade organization of dozens of northern European cities, from, all the way from London, connecting all the way into northern Russia. And here's that Novgorod, right? So connecting dozens of cities between London and northern Russia into, a, into their own trade network that goes beyond the boundaries of any state organization. So it's a large um, European trade organization? A yeah, large European trade organization. Very good. It will create its own system of courts, uh, their own essentially military that can defend the trade network. And it will be an important uh, conduit of, of furs heading from Russia, for example, further to the west, of uh, fish in, the, north, uh, in the, uh, the Baltic Sea and in the North Sea uh, being traded throughout these cities, and, and lumber and timber from up in Sweden making it down into northern Europe. So you said there are furs in Russia, lumber and timber in, uh, in Sweden, and uh, fish from the North Sea. So essentially, in the absence of a state, they create their own state trade organization that goes beyond any, any boundaries that would have existed between the countries or between those regions. Finally, I want to close off uh, with just some discussion of the time period in general. Uh, the post-classical period, we're going to see the development of, of four major civilizations around the world that will all lead to increased trade connections. I'm talking about the Byzantine Empire, the Chinese dynasty of the, the Tang and the Song dynasties, the Islamic Caliphates, and then the Mongol Empire. Each one of those, and we've already spent time in this class talking about each one of those, but each one of those are going to grow tremendously during this time period and they will facilitate trade both within their region and in connecting to other regions. And so you guys already know this. If you can find them geographically, you know what regions they're connecting to. So the Byzantine Empire is going to connect with the Arab world. And also north into Kiev and Rus and, and what, is, what we today refer to as Russia. In China, the Tang Dynasty is going to dramatically expand to the west. And it shouldn't surprise you, not only is expanding to the west going to be helpful in keeping northern nomadic tribes out, but it's also expanding to the west over what route? Silk expanding route. over that Silk Road. So to gain control of, of more trade routes. 
The Islamic caliphates we've already mentioned, Muhammad was a traitor by, by, by or, from his origin. So trade in, in the Islamic caliphates is going to be encouraged. So that's going to link up the Arabian world with all of North Africa, into Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and that Swahili coast of East Africa. And then finally the Mongols, of course, creating the biggest land empire in human history. And across that land empire they will facilitate trade and tremendous growth in trade, especially that land-based trade. Questions, comments, concerns from anybody?